Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hello, everybody. And uh, welcome to a special Grand Rounds presentation. All right. So today uh, we're going to do something a little different than uh, we usually do. We're going to have a series of three presentations from assistant professors in our department. And this will highlight some of the ongoing research that's happening on our talented uh, uh, young faculty members. I want to note we were going to have four presentations, but uh, Joy Choi um, had to leave town for a, a family health issue, um, but she'll be presenting next year during the angle rounds, so we'll get to hear her then. But for today, we have um, Ian Siro, Brian Kane, and Caroline Silva. That will be the order of the presentations. Each presentation will be about uh, 14 minutes or so, and then what I'd like to do is have about three four minutes of questions after each presentation. And uh, uh, if there's time at the end, of course, we can have more questions, but I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to answer questions right after their talk. So in terms of the usual housekeeping issues, if you're on Zoom, your cameras are off, your microphones are off. Um, however, we encourage questions and comments. So use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, to uh, send in any comments or questions. Of course, if you're here in the audience, you don't need to use Zoom. Uh, but we, if you have a question, uh, wait till someone gets a microphone to you before you ask it. Um, also, for everybody uh, on Zoom and here, please uh, complete the post-session evaluation. There'll be a QR code that comes up on a slide at the end. A link to the evaluation will come on a um, in the chat box, and then tomorrow there'll be another email. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ian Soro, who will be speaking about predictive equity in suicide risk screening. All right. Let's get more. So momentary pause as we switch slides. So I'm assuming it's not sharing yet, but impressive stuff is happening behind the scenes for those at home. This one. Ooh, very exciting. Okay. Uh, so today I'll be talking about a paper that I uh, recently submitted on predictive equity in suicide risk screening. And in the past, when I've talked about mathy topics at Grand Rounds, I've gotten the feedback that uh, it really helps to review some of the concepts uh, before we dive into the numbers. And the people who gave me that feedback were very specific to clarify that it wasn't for them. It was for all of their friends that the review helped. So, you know, if, if that's not you, just lean back. This is for your friends. Okay, so imagine for a moment that we're constructing a, a new screening instrument. It could be some questions, it could be a blood test, it could be uh, a uh, machine learning algorithm that we use in the e-record, and we want to know who's at risk of attempting suicide in the near future. So imagine that we have a sample of people that we follow for several months, um, and in this case there are just 25 of them. Uh, the future suicides, which we will know because we follow those people, are shaded darkly. The people who ended up not being at risk are shaded lightly, and we can start keeping track of some statistics already. The first one that you might be interested in is the base rate. I'm going to say this word a lot over the course of the conversation, um, and we can calculate that just by keeping track of different groups of people. In this case, how many people were true positives, truly at risk, divided by the total number of people that we have, in this case, that's 12 true positives divided by 25 people gives us a base rate of 48%, which is a shockingly high attempt rate, but it's going to make the math easier. Okay. Imagine then that we apply our test to some people in advance, and it correctly identifies 
uh, most but not all of the people at risk for suicide, we might be interested in how sensitive our test is to the actual disease or negative outcome that we're trying to find. We call that sensitivity. And we can calculate it again just by counting the people that we care about divided by the number of people that are involved in the situation. So in this case, it's 11 correctly labeled positives divided by 12 total true positives, which would give us a sensitivity of about 92%. That's uh, all of the people that we intended to find. How many of them did we actually find? Okay. Tests make mistakes in the other direction too, though. They sometimes correct or mislabel people who are actually safe as being at risk. And so we want to make sure that our test is specific to the outcome that we're, that we're working on. So we calculate specificity in a similar way. It's the number of people who are correctly labeled negative divided by the total number of true negatives that there were out there. These are all the people that were safe that we correctly labeled as safe. Okay. Uh, if you're a clinician sitting in the audience, though, those are some interesting statistics, but they're generally not the one that you are most excited about. What you want to know is what decision should you be making for an individual patient? What's the probability that a patient who just screened positive will actually attempt suicide? This is what determines whether or not you send them home or refer them to inpatient. These are This is the information that has a significant impact on this patient's life. How do we calculate that? This is the number that we're gonna focus on a lot today. Again, it's just counting. We take the total number of test positives that we found. Remember, some of these are accurate. Some of these people are false positives. They're mistakenly labeled as being at risk when they're not actually at risk. And the total number of true positives, which are all the people we correctly identified that way. And we can come up with something called the positive predictive value. Again, just fractions, just counting. It's 11 over 13 in this case, which gives us a PPV of 0.85 which for suicide would be insanely high, but makes the math easier for this, uh, for this uh, uh, example. Okay, keep track of the fact that the opposite of PPV is your false alarms. So for everyone who was labeled correctly as being at risk, the people who were mislabeled were false positives. That's just one minus PPV. Okay, a warning. Uh, the following slide will include some algebra. It's not a ton and it is color coded, um, but there are probably two groups of people in the audience. Um, there are people who are really excited to follow along with all of the steps. Um, and then there's the group of people who are like, this is kind of my lunch break, and I was hoping that this would be a little more straightforward. For that second group of people, uh, you can feel free to get your phones out, maybe do some scrolling for a little while. There will be another slide telling you when you need to come back. My only request is if you're going to take a break, you just believe me that I proved it. Okay, so if you're willing to take my word for it, I'm willing to let you check out. Okay. What I want to notice is that uh, we can do all this math by just counting people with, you know, with our, our fingers and then like tallying them up. But when we're dealing with populations of tens to hundreds of thousands of people, or maybe the 495,000 encounters that we have in this department each year, it helps to be able to keep track of these statistics. And what we'll notice is that we can actually calculate PPV, the thing that we care about when we're clinicians sitting in front of actual people whose lives we need to make decisions about. We can get that another way. Notice that our true test positives was 11 people. That ends up being equal to our total population times the number of people or times the percentage of people who are actually going to attempt suicide times the percentage of those that we found. And if you do that math with the numbers that we had on the previous slide, you'll see that you get 11. The total test positives are equal to all those true positives plus everybody that we misclassified, which is again, our total population, times all the people who weren't going to attempt suicide, times all the people that we miss correctly or mislabeled as going to attempt. Okay. You don't have to memorize this. It'll be on the slide from now on, but just keep track of the fact that there's a process that you could follow. It was just accelerated fractions and it gets you this formula. We can make it a little bit simpler. Actually, we don't even need to know the size of our total population your PPV will be the same. Okay, everybody else, you can come back. Oops. Okay, so we end up with this formula. Let's plug in some numbers here for our sensitivity on our example and our specificity, but I'm gonna notice that the base rate here is not part of our test. The sensitivity is a feature of our test. Is it good or bad? 
the specificity is a feature of our test. Is it good or bad? Those could be different across groups, but in this case, they'll be the same across all our groups. The base rate changes, and that changes how accurate our test is, even though the test is staying the same. So let's plug in some numbers. Imagine that this particular patient came from a population that had about a 13% attempt rate. That would mean if we applied this test to her, we would be about 48% accurate if we correctly, if we labeled her as being at risk. But with just a couple changes, like let's imagine she's from like the West Coast and the suicide rate is maybe half of what it is here. Our accuracy would go down, even though the test is the same. This is not a result of biased test construction, biased wording, bad data, any of those things. This is a consequence of counting and how fractions work. Your accuracy depends on who you're applying your very good test to. Would it make a difference if the base rate changed by only a little bit, maybe from 13% to 14%? Yeah, in this case, it can make about a 2% difference in your positive predictive value, but we care about that because these are the base rates for different groups that we see in our hospital every day. And even a 1% change in your base rate can result in a number needed to produce a disparity. How many people would you need to see before you would have made a different classification if that person's race or gender had been different? That's only 50 people. And we see many, many more people than that in psychiatry. Okay. It is tempting to try and find a solution to this problem, but it is mathematically unavoidable. Um, I spared you the math, um, but if you want to read the paper, you can. Uh, it's actually relatively well written. You can see here that the authors very politely uh, you know, give hints and reminders that we should recall that uh, gamma sub two is always greater than or equal to gamma sub one times the quantity one minus epsilon, as every school child knows. Uh, but just trust me. There is only one exception to the fact that you will have a predictive disparity, even if your test has the same sensitivity and specificity across different groups, there will always be a predictive disparity when their base rates are different. The only exception is perfection, and that doesn't exist in the real world. In the United States, the base rates for suicide are markedly different across groups, and it depends on whether you're talking about children or adults or different types of economic groups, but they are very different and so there will be predictive disparities, no matter what, always. So what do we do? We're looking to build a more equitable world. We don't like disparities, but we're forced into a position where, as a, as a basic consequence of the way that fractions work, you saw the map. It's all just counting and keeping track of who ended up where. What do we do? Uh, I've reviewed several papers, talked to several people, and I've found a couple counterproductive approaches. These are things that you should not do. Um, one, the suicide rates are going up in one group, so they will soon match another group. It is mathematically correct that that will reduce the severity of your predictive disparity, but it comes at the consequence of many thousands of people losing their lives. That's not an acceptable solution to this problem, even though the accounting will be better not a workable way of getting out of the situation. These are real comebacks that I've gotten in reviews. Um, well, we could modify our test, reducing the accuracy of one group to make it even with another group. Also not workable because that will eliminate your disparity on paper, but people will die as a result of what you've done. People aren't usually quite this explicit, but the kinds of things that they advocate in slow motion with lots of adjectives and maybe even some numbers amount to this in the end, not workable. We also have this habit of relying on the assumption that all statistical discrepancies are evidence of discrimination, that anytime the numbers are even, we are safe, and that anytime the numbers are uneven, we're, deserving, we're observing some sort of policy process that's causing some sort of problem. You have a problem but it might not be the result of discrimination. You need to do something else. One, globally more accurate tests are better. As your tests get more accurate, the disparities across groups reduce. So the more accurate you can make your test overall, the less likely you are to, do, to observe an extreme disparity. Second, upstream prevention approaches reduce the need for people to get tested in the first place. 
So if we know that our tests are going to produce biased results, and there's not much that we can do about that because it's a result of just straightforward math, universal prevention approaches that prevent people from getting in the situation where our tests will need to make mistakes for them are better. Uh, and lastly, if we are forced to use tests, and we always will be, uh, reducing the cost of our inevitably wrong predictions is another way that we can make it less harmful. So different types of pay structures, uh, like a European model or um, uh, a system in which you don't have to pay the cost of your mistaken prediction that gets shared among a large population, reduces the damage done by the inevitable mistakes that we do make. If you want to read more, uh, I encourage you to read the paper. I will add that it was a wonderful process working with the editor uh, in this journal. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Ian. That's really a good primer. Really interesting. Thanks. Appreciate it. <clears throat> and useful for so many, uh, so many issues. Okay. Um, do we have any, we have time for some questions, David? Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, really eye-opening. I work in the Suicide Prevention Institute with Dr. Pisani, so oh, great. this is near and dear to my heart. And I, and I guess the question that naive probably that jumped out to me was, if the base rate is such a powerful predictor, mm -hmm. then why bother with any tests? Just look at your population and get the right profile, and can't you just predict it using that without applying a test who is so that's so strongly influenced by sure. the base rate? Right, so the, the simplest test is just closing your eyes and guessing the base rate. Um, and when the base rate is either very high or very low, that's honestly maybe a good idea. It's when it's in the middle and we could make a slightly better prediction where for all groups, it's better to be using the test than to not be using the test, even if it's more better for some groups. You wanna be using the test. And so we're stuck in this position where we can achieve uh, a sort of mere statistical equality by behaving badly. And I wanna resist that temptation because the unevenness that we are forced to produce technically makes every individual person's life better. We just wanna do that in a way that's as fair as possible. And so I, I worry that we're stuck with tests because they are better than the alternative, even though they are still bad. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Okay, well, if not now, then we'll have more time at the end for questions. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Ian. Um, All right, um, everyone hear me okay? Okay, everyone hear me okay? Okay. So the title of the talk is Functional Disconnectivity of Visual and Somatomotor Networks Yields a Simple and Robust Biomarker for Psychosis. So this work is under review in the journal, so um, I welcome any feedback that you have. So our work uh, was motivated some, uh, by some prior studies uh, looking at resting state functional connectivity in people with schizophrenia. Um, these influential studies have uh, shown convincingly that within people with schizophrenia, there is hypoconnectivity between cortical regions within sensory networks um, and uh, at the level of the cortex. 
and also that the thalamus is hyperconnected to these same cortical regions within sensory networks. So this prior work uh, uh, kind of motivated us to ask a few questions. One is, do these results arise by the early illness stages rather than in the more uh, chronic uh, uh, aspects of the illness or, or uh, illness stages? Also, which sensory networks are implicated? So um, they use statistical methods that, that could not specify which sensory networks were involved because they involved the, uh, the resting state uh, methods uh, did not remove indirect connections between regions. And most importantly, can these results from resting state actually provide a viable biomarker for psychosis? So what exactly do we expect from a neuroimaging biomarker? Well, there are a few things. One, perhaps obviously we need a large effect size uh, that differentiates the psychosis patients from healthy controls. Also, the effect should be, uh, the, uh, the biomarker should be easy to interpret. Um, the biomarker should be robust to confounds, including antipsychotic medication and comorbidities. Um, it should be recoverable from a relatively brief scan session so that you can reduce expense and also increase the tolerability for the patient. Um, it should differentiate psychosis patients, not just uh, compared to healthy controls, but also clinical controls. It should generalize to unseen data. It should improve upon more standard methods for discriminating psychosis patients, such as tests of cognition which are already known to discriminate groups, should have good test retest reliability. And so the question is, is there such a biomarker? And we propose that, yes, there is a biomarker that satisfies most of these criteria. We call it the somatovisual biomarker. So the methods that we use are as follows. Um, so we adopt the Glasser uh, parcellation schema, which was published in 2016. It's an atlas that uh, basically divides each hemisphere of uh, the brain into 180 uh, cortical regions that are individually um, individuated by uh, cortical thickness, myelination, and resting state functional connectivity. So 180 uh, cortical regions per hemisphere. Uh, and these regions themselves can be divvied up into 12 different resting state networks. So these are color coded here. You can see the 12 different re resting state networks. And we're focusing here on sensory networks. So there are four sensory networks, part of this brain network partition that we use. There's the uh, primary visual network, which includes the primary visual cortex. There's the secondary visual network, which includes lateral occipital areas and back here on the side of the brain. There's a somatomotor network, which includes the somatosensory cortex and primary motor cortex. And then there's audit the auditory network. So these are the four networks of interest. So in addition to the 360 cortical regions I just showed you, um, the uh, brain network partition also applies to subcortex. And so uh, there are 358 subcortical regions in addition to the 360 cortical regions. So there's a total of 718 parcels and each of these belongs to one of the 12 resting state networks. And we're focusing on the four sensory networks as noted. Uh, so the data that I'm going to be presenting you uh, to you uh, derive mainly from the ACP early psychosis data set, which is a public data set that comprises 54 health, healthy controls, um, 81 non-affective psychosis patients, and 24 affective psychosis patients. And each of these individuals underwent four uh, resting state scans that uh, lasted five and a half minutes each, so a total of 22 minutes. Um, it was a pretty high spatial resolution uh, scan that they used using multiband um, pulse sequence for those of you who might be uh, familiar. familiar. Um, and we did minimal pre-processing using a containerized app called fMRI Prep, and we used a 36 parameter plus motion scrubbing um, uh, post pre-processing schema as described by Sierra and colleagues. And then finally, we use something called principal components multiple regression to derive a, a, a resting state functional connectivity matrix for each individual. And this has been described in a paper of ours in 2021 uh, in our image. Uh, and so basically what, we, uh, what this whole kind of series of steps gives you is a resting state matrix for each person. And this is a 718 by 718 matrix. And it tells you how each region is functionally connected to every other region in the brain. So the key connectivity variables um, for each network are as follows. First of all, we're interested in cortical, cortical connectivity. And this is basically the average connection weight between all cortical parcels of a network. And then also the thalamocortical connectivity, which is the average connection weights between the thalamus 
and all cortical parcels of a network. So basically you have these two values for each network and each person. So just to make this a little bit more concrete, here's a resting state functional connectivity matrix for a person. I'm just showing you the cortical parcels. Each of those pixels indicates how much a region is connected to another region. And so these are clustered by network and they're color coded on, on the outskirts of the matrix. And so um, here's the visual two network in purple. And so those are the cortical cortical connectivity values um, for visual two network. And you just average those values and it gives you a single number. So uh, we compared the patient groups in the, HC, in the ACP data set. Um, we compared all of the patients versus the healthy controls. I should say that there was no significant differences between the affective and non-affective psychosis patients that were just collapsing across those two groups. So first of all, we found uh, that there was cortical cortical uh, hypo connectivity, which means that the cortical regions were talking to each other. They were less connected to each other in exactly two of the sensory networks, the visual two network and the somatomotor network. And uh, in the legend in the center that shows hedges G, which is just a, basically a version of Cohen's D. So medium to large effect sizes here when you compare psychosis patients compared to controls. Also for thalamocortical connectivity, we found hyperconnectivity, again, consistent with past work. And the effect sizes were medium to large and, and it was involved the same two networks as before. So you have equal and opposite effects of cortical, cortical hypoconnectivity and thalamocortical hyperconnectivity in psychosis patients. So these results are interesting but, and encouraging, but they're probably not large enough to form uh, a biomarker. You need larger effect sizes. So uh, what should we do? Um, so we defined what we call a somatovisual biomarker in a, fall, in, in a few simple steps. Um, basically, what we did is we averaged the thalamocortical values across the somatomotor and uh, uh, secondary visual networks. Then we averaged the cortical, cortical values across those same two networks. Then we normalized each of those values across all subjects. And then we simply subtracted them. So we took the thalamocortical connectivity value minus the cortical cortical connectivity value. So this gives you one value per subject. So here are the effects uh, with, this is a transposed violin plot with overlapping scatter with patients in red and controls in green. And you can see that there's a Hedges G value of 0.95, which is pretty large and it's highly significant. And so the larger the value on the x-axis, the more patient-like the person is. Um, you also wanna show, make sure that these results are robust, right? This is always a question. So we looked only at patients who were extra still in the scanner because motion within the scanner is a well-known confound. And so the patients in this sample were exactly matched to controls on in-scanner motion and the effect size actually got slightly larger. We also looked at antipsychotic naive patients in the ACP sample. And so there are 22 of those individuals and the effect size was quite large when you compared them to healthy controls. And finally, we looked at only at ACP psychosis patients who had no comorbidities, no major depression, no anxiety uh, disorder, no past history of concussion, no mild or moderate substance use disorder, and no nicotine use. So when you compare just those patients to controls, you get, uh, once again, a nice large effect size. So this is interesting. So we've shown that you can get these large effects with 22 minutes of resting state, but maybe can you just get the same thing if you have five and a half minutes of resting state? So to get at that question, we just look at the very first resting state scan. And what we found is that you get a nice large effect when you compare patients versus controls. So in five minutes of, of resting state, you can get a nice group separation. So this is nice because the scans are, are expensive and, and sometimes people can't tolerate the longer scan sessions. Can these results be replicated? So nowadays when you show an effect, lots of people are skeptical and they still don't believe you. So you need to show the, result in multiple, the results in multiple data sets. So I'm gonna show you data that I personally collected at Rutgers University as part of a K award. And we had 22 psychosis patients and 19 healthy controls. And once again, we get a nice large effect differentiating the psychosis patients compared to controls. Is, are these results specific to psychosis? Maybe it's just general psychopathology that's causing this, not, not, nothing specific to psychosis, is, is that true? So to get at that question, uh, we reanalyzed data that we published in 2021 in Science Advances. I was a middle author on this paper. And um, in addition to healthy controls and schizophrenia patients, there was also an ADHD control group. 
And we found that once again, psychosis and schizophrenia patients showed higher biomarker values than the two control groups. The effect size was somewhat smaller, but I should say that this was a legacy data set. So overall, it was lower quality data. And so that could be partly explaining why the effect size was smaller, but still highly significant. Another question that comes up is, can this predict diagnosis out of samples? So can you make a model with one sample and then kind of predict diagnosis in an entirely different sample? So we examined this in three steps. Um, we took the ACP data and for each group, um, subject group, we discovered, we uh, split them up either to a discovery or a held out data set. Then we built a model on the discovery data set using um, weighted binary logistic regression. And we used to leave one out cross validation to get classification statistics like Ian was talking about, like sensitivity, specificity, and so on. And then we examined whether that model could predict diagnosis in the held out data. So here are the results. So here's a discovery data set with 27 controls and 38 patients. I should say that the patients were matched to controls on in scanner motion in this sample. And you can see you get pretty good values here. AUC of 0.78 area under the curve value and uh, pretty good sensitivity and specificity as well. And most importantly, you could take that model that you constructed from the uh, discovery data set and you could make accurate predictions about what group they belong to in the held out data. You, and the, the, uh, the numbers were similar to before, if not better. Okay, well, that's, that's great. So we have a biomarker, but we already have these other very simple cognitive tasks that can distinguish psychosis patients from healthy controls. Can this resting state biomarker do any better? Can it make predictions over and above what can be had with neurocognition? Um, so we use the auditory continuous performance task, a version of this task that involves uh, auditory working memory. And it's one of the best cognitive tasks for distinguishing converting clinical high-risk patients as compared to healthy controls and as compared to non-converting clinical high-risk patients for psychosis, as shown in the 2016 paper. So here's what we found, um, showing you the ROC curves here, sensitivity and one minus specificity, and the ACPT, uh, the uh, cognition task is shown in blue. And the, when you add in the uh, resting state biomarker to the ACPT, so you have, a, you have two variables instead of one, um, you do get an improvement in sensitivity and specificity. And this, uh, this was shown to be highly significant with a likelihood ratio test. And we get similar results with the held out data. So you do get a prediction uh, uh, ability from this biomarker over and above what can be had with neurocognition. Final question that comes up is, uh, okay, well, you know, people are interested in biomarkers only insofar as they are reliable. So how is the test we test reliability? So the method here is relatively straightforward. We looked, we calculated the biomarker value for the first pair of resting state scans and the second pair of resting state scans. So keep in mind that there were four resting state, state scans in total, and the two of them occurred near the beginning of the session and two near the end. So there's a 35 minute interval between those two pairs of resting state scans. And we calculated risk scores using a binary logistic regression um, that I mentioned before uh, for each pair of scans. And we also calculated intraclass correlation and here are the results. So the interclass correlation was 0.59, which is of moderate value using conventional benchmarks. And also the risk scores calculated between those two time points were, were pretty strongly correlated and highly significant. So they're moderately reliable. So to summarize, uh, we provide evidence for a novel and simple and interpretable biomarker for psychosis. It did not depend on in-scan emotion, medication, nicotine, substance use, or psychiatric comorbidities. It emerged within a five minute resting state scan. It can be replicated in two additional uh, data sets, one, in, one of which involved a psychiatric control group. Uh, it could generalize out of sample, and it could improve upon cognitive measures, and it was moderately reliable. So the next steps for an R01 application, which is under review, is that uh, we're going to determine the structural basis of this bi biomarker using structure, uh, diffusion MRI with the help of uh, some other people like Jeff Lazarian. Uh, we're going to include other con clinical con control groups, which might be more relevant, like uh, people with major depression with no psychotic features. And also, we're going to consider longer test retest uh, intervals uh, up to one month. And then finally, we can improve the reliability of this biomarker by using uh, more sophisticated uh, methods at the acquisition stage called multi-echo multi fMRI. Uh, last slide. So is this clinically useful? Uh, we argue, yes, it, it can be uh, and number, for a number of reasons. Uh, it could help gauge psychosis risk among individuals at clinical high risk for psychosis. 
uh, and it could also help us understand the variety of sensory and motor impairments that are well known in schizophrenia. And that's been documented by myself, Steve Silverstein, and others. So I'd like to thank the co-authors and also the people uh, who are in my lab, the Vision and Psychosis Lab. And also this work was supported by a K Ward partly. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Very interesting. So I know I have questions, but let's see if anyone else has questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, so probably I will just say this is a little over my head, so if this is a silly question, feel free to just ignore me. Um, I was thinking about um, on your graph that you kind of had that control population kind of replicated in a lot of different ways. And then on your x-axis, you kind of pointed to like the more patient like yeah yeah um so i guess what are the implications for those who are identified sort of in the control group that did live more towards the right side um of your x-axis yeah. there like are there implications for things that are undiagnosed or other types of implications for that control group and are there implications in the future research depending on the how you're categorizing that population yeah it's a great question um so they could have psychotic like experiences or they could have schizotypal personality disorder and so on. Um, the answer is, I don't know. I mean, some of it could also be caused by noise. So you always also have to be you know, vigilant to that uh, probability because fMRI is a noisy kind of method. And so there are ways of getting around that. But um, I would say a lot of them could just be noise, but there could be some people who are actually um, might have susceptibility to schizophrenia or, or psychosis. Any other questions? So if not, you know, the, uh, that would be something good to check, right? Who those people are, who are the healthy people yeah, who have the same yeah. connectivity patterns. And of course, another thing to think about is, well, how is that related to, how are those patterns related to the symptoms that people yeah, that bring that's them a great to the question. clinic? Yeah. Unfortunately, the ACP data set that we used was um, uh, extremely asymptomatic. <laughs> I mean, only 2% of them had moderate symptoms that were positive, negative, or disorganized. Um, so when you have that, that homogeneous sort of, you know, um, that homogeneity and symptoms, it's almost impossible to find any sort of correlation. Um, same thing with level of functioning. It was a very highly functioning group. Um, so that made it harder to find any clinical correlates. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that's something that we really want to look at. Yeah. I would think if you're having um, kind of extra uh, flow through the thalamus and who knows, maybe other subcortical structures and less connect connection in the cortex, you'd be yeah. vulnerable to, um, you know, not seeing reality the same way other people do, to say the least, right? It's yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, visual perceptual abnormalities is something you and I have published on, and so yeah. that, that would also to be interesting to, to link those up. And the other thing is, you know, perceptual organization involves, you know, lateral occipital cortex, V4, V2, that's all part of the secondary visual network. So it'd be interesting to see if there are relationships between, you know, hypoconnectivity and hyperconnectivity in those networks and um, behavioral performance um, on these visual tests. Okay, well, thank you, Brian, and getting a good lesson in uh, methods in psychiatric research here today. And, um, now we're gonna to go to another uh, suicide-related presentation from Caroline Silva. They're on the desk. They should all get Please do not try to use the QR code until, oh, until 1245. It will not work until then. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm talking a little bit today about some of the work that I'm doing, particularly focused on cultural social engagement and the experience of belonging among Hispanic Latino adults, uh, specifically outpatients um, who are at risk for suicide. Um, so to give a little bit of background 
Hispanic Latinos make up uh, the largest racial ethnic minority group in the country. And by 2060, they're expected to be about a quarter of the population. Um, but in Monroe County, um, we actually have about 18% uh, of the population, 19% in the city of Rochester, Hispanic Latino, which is about average. This is different if you were like, let's say in New York City or Miami, but that's about the average um, size right now across the country. As you can see, this varies greatly where you are in the Finger Lakes region and where you are in Monroe County. Um, and so we're really, uh, our population here is really clustered in the city of Rochester. And something that makes um, New York unique and Rochester unique is that the majority of our Latino population here is Puerto Rican, about 80%. That is compared to the rest of the United States where on average about 61% of the population is Mexican American among Latinos. Um, and I will talk about why this matters in a minute. Um, so thinking about suicide risk and culture, I've been focusing particularly on this population. And uh, in, in light of Ian's talk about base rates, I think this is uh, applicable here. So. Uh, Latino uh, populations have been historically at decreased risk for suicide. So these are um, suicide rates among uh, non-Hispanic Black individuals, uh, non-Hispanic whites, and um, Hispanics in 2019, so pre-COVID. And as you can see, historically, uh, Latinos have been at a decreased risk for death by suicide, including um, where they are more at risk differs from our non-Hispanic white population. So we see the peak among Latinos in your mid in like your 20s, whereas typically for non-Hispanic whites, you see the peak in midlife and later life. Um, but despite historically being at decreased risk, when you look at the changes over the last two decades among suicide rates among uh, our Latino population in this country, there has been a relatively speaking about 50% increase, mostly accounted for by Hispanic women. I always like to point out here, though, that um, the y-axes on these are not the same. Uh, the rates are much higher for Hispanic men. We're just seeing an, an increase, particularly among Hispanic women, from uh, about the early 2000s. So when we think about suicide risk among Latinos, and we know that Latinos are not all a monolithic group, um, they come from many different countries, many different experiences, different generations. Suicide risk also varies by many of these characteristics. So birth origin is one of the big uh, things that varies. So um, US born Hispanics are at higher risk than foreign born Hispanics. And then this also increases across generations. So for example, my parents immigrated to this country. So they're considered first generation. I'm considered second generation. My children would be considered third generation. Suicide risk increases with every single generation such so that by the third generation or fourth generation, among Hispanic Latinos, the risk has increased about three to four times. Um, and then amongst uh, nationalities, uh, Puerto Ricans have the highest uh, rates of depression, uh, anxiety, uh, suicide ideation, attempts and death among all Hispanic Latino groups. So of particular interest, I think, to us here, especially at URMC, because this is the population that we are serving, um, largely. But what, one of the big problems that we have is that there's especially a lack of suicide prevention interventions for Hispanic Latino adults, especially uh, Spanish speakers. There are some for youth, um, but nothing for adults, and that's sort of where my focus comes in on. Some qualitative work that has been done um, has asked people, well, what do you think in the community stakeholders should be included in a suicide prevention intervention for Hispanic Latinos? And those focus not just on sustainable strategies and raising awareness, but particularly promoting social connection and cultural enrichment. Um, and so some of the work that I'm doing is trying to focus on that exact thing. Um, so we know that historically, you'll get, this is the conceptual model that I based my work off of, on the right side, we know that uh, social connection, social isolation, and in particular belonging is associated with suicide ideation. Um, one of the bigger theories that looks at this is the interpersonal theory of suicide. Um, we also know that acculturative stress, so this is stress experienced by minority group and adapting to a majority group's culture. This can include things like discrimination, language uh, barriers, and so on, um, is, has also been linked to increased suicide ideation and attempts among Latino populations. 
Um, some people have thought that the reason it increases risk is because a culture of stress erodes um, social roles, social relationships, norms, these things that might be protective in a particular culture, um, uh, in a particular cultural group. And so I was positing that this uh, thing that I'm calling cultural social engagement is particularly affected um, when people are geographically and linguistically isolated. So I focused my work mostly on Spanish speakers recently. Cultural social engagement um, is when you're engaged not just in social activities, but social activities that are particularly valued by you and your culture. So think about things that you might do in terms of traditions, celebrations, ways that you connect with other people culturally. So this could be involved food. Um, this can include other customs and practices. And if you think about this for yourself, right, we might each have a little bit sort of a different sort of things that make us feel culturally close to others. Um, and so one thing that we wanted to do was understand the uh, relationship between these sort of culturally, socially valued experiences and belonging, but in people's real time, real world context, because that's where you're living, right? That's where culture happens. Um, and so we've been using uh, mobile uh, health uh, measures to do this, as particularly on smartphones. Um, so this is a little bit big brother, but um, we uh, lend people smartphones and then they answer surveys on it multiple times a day. We also are tracking GPS location and we're also capturing ambient audio. So uh, surveys are capturing sort of the subjective psychological experience of, you know, what it is like to belong as well as things like suicide ideation. Um, and then the GPS and ambient audio are capturing more objective social behaviors. Um, and in this case, for example, like culturally specific social behaviors. So one of the pilot studies that um, we did a couple uh, years ago, uh, but this was like right pre-COVID. So we got lucky in that way because many of us uh, kind of isolated during that time. Um, we uh, gave um, Hispanic Latino outpatients um, who speak Spanish uh, smartphones for two weeks and then just tracked uh, uh, cultural, cultural social engagement, belonging, ideation over the course of, of those two weeks. Participants had to be 18 or older, Hispanic Latino, and have reported experiencing passive or active suicide ideation in the last month. So passive ideation would be something like, I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up versus active ideation would be, you know, I am thinking about ways to end my life. Um, and so they would get surveys four times a day. And we were also doing the GPS tracking and ambient audio. So I'll present a little bit of the data from this, uh, which has sort of influenced our current work. Um, so we ended up having 15 people who did the study, majority female, um, about 44 years of age. Um, primarily, if you look we, uh, at diagnoses, um, people were mostly uh, depressed, so major depressive disorder or dysthymia, um, although we did have some people with um, anxiety disorders and lifetime history of psychotic disorders. In all fairness, though, um, psychotic symptoms are very common. Um, among Latino populations um, in the context of mood disorders, and it's often misdiagnosed as schizophrenia. So that's likely mood disorders with psychotic symptoms. Um, but that mostly shows we didn't exclude anybody as long as they could consent and understood the procedures. Even if they didn't have a phone, we were providing everybody with phones. Um, so this is just a snapshot of what the day-to-day -day variability in uh, ideation and belonging, thwarted belonging looked like in this population. So thwarted belonging is um, feeling like uh, lonely, uh, like I don't have uh, reciprocally caring relationships. So in this case, the uh, y-axis is standardized. So higher scores are worse on, on both of these. Um, one thing that I think was particularly interesting, if you look at the, the black line, which is ideation, is that although everybody to be in the study had to report either passive or active ideation in the last month, about 50% of our sample during these two weeks didn't have any ideation um, or movement on it. Um, but as you can see, uh, thwarted belonging was much more up and down throughout the two weeks. Um, so we wanted to know what, 
whether uh, cultural social engagement that people self-reported on was associated with their experiences of belonging. Um, so because this was a sample that was largely depressed and anhedonic, they were not engaging in many cultural uh, social activities. So they only endorsed it about 11% of the time, um, which averaged out about to four activities for, this, for each subject over two weeks. Um, and these activities, we asked them to self-define what they were. And these included things like holiday celebrations, um, other events like quinceañeras, um, religious uh, spiritual events, but a lot of events that centered around family, including activities at home. Um, and also food was a big one, uh, <laughs> which is a theme that constantly comes up in most of my studies for some reason. Um, so then we looked at uh, belonging following cultural social engagement. So uh, when people were pained, they would have to answer whether or not they had engaged in a culturally social activity within the last four hours, and then how they were feeling right then and there in that moment. So we also measured other, uh, other things like loneliness, social impairment, but also thwarted belonging. And the lighter bar is um, the, uh, their, their scores on that beforehand and then immediately after uh, engaging in culturally, socially relevant activities. And so we did see a decrease across all of them, but interestingly, and I would love to chat about this with some of y'all in the future, the only one that was significant, but a quite significant change was specific to thwarted belonging. Not loneliness, not social impairment, just thwarted belonging. So essentially, after engaging in a culturally meaningful social activity, people felt more like they belonged, right? Didn't change their loneliness, didn't change their social impairment, but how they belonged. Um, and so this has influenced our next steps. Uh, we are currently looking at the GPS data to try to understand how these experiences are happening um, in specific activity spaces, right? Like where are people engaging in culturally social activities? Um, as we know, there's probably fewer opportunities in places like Rochester than Miami, right? Um, how does this relate if you're spending a large time at home? So this one just shows where people are spending their time in Monroe County. Again, very concentrated in the city of Rochester. Every different color is a different participant, um, but where they went. As you see, some people didn't have much movement at all over the entire two weeks, and some people did. Um, and then here we can see where they were in Monroe County when they were report, or sorry, in City of Rochester when they reported a cultural social activity. We can see uh, how uh, much uh, thwarted belonging they were feeling with the lighter colors being feeling less belonging, right? So higher, lighter colors are worse um, where they were at that point in time. Um, and then we can also see where they were at the point in time when they were reporting, experiencing active or current ideation for those who reported it. Um, and our hope is to try to understand how these things overlap and how they overlay to really understand somebody's experience in their cultural environmental context. So this is overlapping ideation with thwarted belonging in the moment uh, in this particular time and space. So currently, um, uh, conducting a pilot a randomized clinical trial of uh, trying to see if we can use a behavioral intervention uh, called engaged coaching to increase uh, engagement in culturally socially valued activities. Um, and the idea with uh, engage is mostly that you use action planning. And so it's been used, um, especially with uh, older adults in with depression. Uh, if those of you who are familiar with behavioral activation, it has many of the same principles, but it's simplified. And so we have simplified it even further where we have participants choose what activities they're doing, but we constrain it to activities that are culturally valued with another person. Um, Individuals are randomized to that or a psychoeducation control, and then we are tracking outcomes using the same EMA techniques as in the previous study uh, at baseline after the intervention, and then uh, three months afterwards to see if we can detect changes in belonging and then suicide ideation. Um, oh, uh, next steps, though, will also include hopefully looking at different dimensions of cultural connection and understanding what aspects of them are really mattering for our population here. So is that belonging to others? Is it belonging to family? Is it belonging to a, a sense of place, right? Um, a, a shared history? 
all of these different things that culture gives you um, with the idea that hopefully we can optimize the intervention if we pick up a signal <laughs> that it is increasing belonging um, in our future studies and before conducting a full scale RCT. So I will pause there because we have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, very interesting. Um, really, yeah, interesting thought provoking use of technology. So, uh, do we have questions from the audience? Ellen G. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, quick question, how would you, and this is a bit out of the box, but how would you say, what are the implications for this with a more severe population? Like how could we bring a thwarted belongingness, social engagement, culturally appropriate to the 18% of patients that we serve here on our clinical units? So if I heard correctly, um, how would we bring this to like some of our more clinically severe populations, right? Because these were all outpatients. You know, and so I think part of the question is, you know, how can, so like, well, I'm observing like the coaching, for example, are the number of barriers that are coming up. And these are for um, our individuals who are experiencing less severe symptoms, right? And so I think the idea of like, I'm thinking inpatient, right? Um, that can be connecting um, to maybe a provider who is also sharing uh, you know, cultural history with you. A lot of the work that we've been doing is with Lasos Fuertes, where um, all of the providers in that mental health clinic, they speak Spanish, so we don't need to use interpreters. Um, they also usually share like a cultural background with their patients. Um, and so I think a lot of our patients struggle when they go uh, to like the inpatient units and they don't have somebody to connect with and, and other individuals. But I think, because that might be a hard uh, uh, <laughs> bar to reach, um, uh, I think figuring out how to do, um, well, good handoff with people's sort of outpatient therapists and then having that be the focus, setting the goal setting, the action planning of what are you going to do to feel more connected when you leave here and that are in line with your cultural values um, and making that an active process that we actually follow up on um, over the kind of course of care. So building off of this, actually, you popped a thought in my head, Ellen G. Um, I, I was thinking about when you see that change in thwarted belonging, but not on other mm. metrics that we might expect, um, whether there's sort of a piece here of um, increasing like identity salience. So by engaging in that activity, even if you're doing it by yourself, are you reminding yourself that you're part of a broader group that shares a cultural value and then it mitigates against that feeling of thwarted belonging? And so is there a way to then maybe roll that in where mm -hmm. you can engage in culturally salient activities, but maybe not with somebody else or with somebody who has the same identity with you that might sort of hit in the middle of what you're... Yeah, and so this has been something that's been maybe both a strength and, and a weakness is trying to figure out like, how are we defining this type of social activity? So um, with my studies, I've specified the activity has to be with somebody else. So not necessarily a cultural activity that you're doing by yourself, right? Um, but there has been like one study that has shown that increased cultural involvement, even if it's by yourself, especially among adolescents, does decrease, um, uh, I think, like attempts. Um, so it's possible that there's a range of activities and I've um, had people define a cultural social activity with somebody else, even if they don't share the same culture as where they're able to share their culture, share something that's important to them. Again, large examples are like food. Um, and so there are many, I think, ways to, um, bring this, uh, to, you know, in care and, and, uh, to different people, um, but I think a large part of what we've done with the intervention that we're doing is having people do an exercise where they define what their cultural values are, right? Because that's going to then influence what goals they set and what areas they feel are being met and are not being met. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank the three presenters, not only for really great presentations, but for putting them together on very short notice literally a week. 
Um, so thank you again. This was really great. And I think we should do this again. Anyway, thank you all for coming. See you next time. <laughs>